Hey, what's up guys? This is Adam from Rescue Michigan and I am sunburned in case you didn't notice. I just got back from Antrim County, Michigan, where there was the big rally with Mike Lindell and several other speakers. It was a great time and I'm glad I went. I had considered maybe spending the weekend at home preparing for a possible hearing we may have in the election committee in the state house this coming Tuesday on the seven bills that we just had introduced this past week. And I'll talk about all those in detail in just a moment here, but I uh, just want to share what a great time it was. Uh, we have a, here's actually a photo of the event. And uh, this is, um, it's probably a little over a thousand people. I'm guessing maybe you see there's this big tent on the left where the American flag is. That's the Trump, Trump unity bridge was right there. Uh, and then there is all these people uh, coming to check out the show. So it was a great time. And of course, any reason to go up north in the summer is worth taking up. Um, for me, I think probably the highlight for me was meeting Tim Griffin, who was one of the attorneys for the Thomas Morris Law Center, who was involved in some of the election lawsuits and just kind of comparing notes and talking about legal strategy and some other things moving forward. Uh, it was really good to hear from him and to meet him personally. And of course, it's always fun to, to see all your friends and see lots of people that you've been involved in politics with over the years and reconnect with them. So uh, it was a great time. It was an absolute blast. I hope you could make it if you were there. Uh, and if not, well, I would just say anytime you get the opportunity to go up north in the summertime, take it because Antrim County is beautiful. Uh, there's a place I like to go near Cadillac on the Pine River where the kayaking is really good. But this is my first time in Antrim County. And uh, same idea, beautiful, beautiful place. In fact, uh, I'll show you here. We have, um, let me see if I can go to my uh, photo of the Airbnb. This was, by the way, the star of the show is Frisky Farm. That's where this was. And you can see behind me, they had uh, a really nice restaurant and a gift shop. And then there's also, they had some food carts and things out there and they had great food. So if you're ever up in Antrim County, be sure to visit Frisky Farm. Uh, they apparently, and they didn't really get into the details, but the owner of the farm did come up on the stage for a little bit. And uh, they had mentioned that the governor and the attorney general have been attacking them viciously, presumably for the same thing they're attacking all people in Michigan for. Uh, violating the governor's illegal, unconstitutional, tyrannical lockdown orders. Uh, but I'm not sure. So definitely check them out and support them if you're going to go up north. And also, uh, let me show you the Airbnb where we stayed was on Shook's Farm. It was only about 10 minutes up the street. And there was a winery right next door. So it was a really good place. How do I go to the next file here? There we go. That was the view from our Airbnb. And it's hard to see in the photo, but you could see all the way to Grand Traverse Bay uh, just from the porch. It was really nice. So again, another great place to check out. And they had a winery next door. So Shook's Farm and then the 1914 Winery. That was the place where we stayed. And beautiful, beautiful country. So uh, yeah, great times all around. And I'm glad I went. Uh, and it was it was a great event. Great, great, great rally. Great to see people. Um, great to meet and interact with people. So a lot of fun. Anyway. So we have seven bills introduced in the state house. They have been issued bill numbers. You can find them at legislature.mi.gov. Uh, from their homepage, you just put in the bill numbers. Uh, there's a little field to say bill number. You just put in 4952, 4962, 4963, 4964, 65, 66, and 67. And those are the seven bills. Uh, 4952 is the only one that's not in sequence because I think the representative turned his in early. But you can see they got some co-sponsors there. You can see the bill right there. Uh, this is Representative Maddox's bill. This is the one to require that signature verification take place in meetings where they are open to poll challengers and poll watchers. They have to provide public notice since it is, after all, the most important, most sensitive part of the entire absentee ballot tabulation process is verifying the signatures. And last year, of course, they did it behind closed doors and the Secretary of State illegally, according to the Court of Claims, required they presumptively assume every signature is valid, which is something that is not what has been done historically uh, in elections. That is definitely going against precedent there for obviously some very newly emerging political reasons as to why that would be. Uh, we'll be talking more about that in the hearing, I think. Uh, then we have uh, 4962. This is Representative Riley's bill. This is for genuine bipartisan apportionment of poll workers. And again, you know, we've talked a lot about poll challengers and eyewitnesses and all of that. But, you know, the poll workers are the ones who actually administer the election. And, it, you know, and elections are an adversarial process in which two opposing parties are competing for real power. 
And of course, you have to have people on both sides administering the election to make sure that neither side is able to break the rules. And of course, in Detroit, uh, they systematically brought in ringers. They brought in underage minors. They brought in people that couldn't even actually perform the duties of the job because of the limitations on their work permits, which minors have. Uh, so what we do in our bill is propose that, first of all, preference goes to the people that the county parties identify as being actual members of those parties. Because in Michigan, we don't have partisan voter registration. And there's no easy way to know if someone claims to be a member of a party when they apply to be a poll worker. No one is the wiser. Typically, there's no way to challenge that. Uh, so what we have here is the first preference goes to those the parties actually ask them to hire if they do apply and they're qualified. Uh, then the people who are registered voters. And, and then lastly, everybody else, aliens, felons, minors, uh, et cetera. Actually, in Michigan, felons can vote after they're, after they're out of incarceration. But I digress. Uh, and, and also among each of those categories that they actually elect them randomly too. They can't just pick their friends to be the poll workers. And of course, that is exactly what we saw in Detroit. It also requires they have an open and transparent process for the hiring, um, that they have uh, actual, an actual window of time when hiring is open. They have to post notice on their website. Uh, so they can't just uh, hand out applications to their friends, which again happened in certain places in Michigan and should not be allowed to happen again. So that is Representative Riley's bill. And again, you can see there's several other co-sponsors of that bill. Then we have 4963. This is Representative Steve Cara's bill on the rights of poll challengers, something that Representative Cara knows about personally, as he was both a plaintiff in the case on the rights of poll challengers, and then even after the Secretary of State settled out of court agreeing to his terms, uh, she then broke the agreement and he was an eyewitness to the infringing of the rights of poll challengers. So uh, this is Representative Kara's bill, uh, and it requires that um, all poll workers be trained to know that impeding poll challengers is a felony in Michigan. Uh, it requires that the poll workers wear name tags uh, under penalty of misdemeanor so that if they do infringe on poll challengers' rights, they can identify, the poll challengers can identify who was infringing on their rights. Uh, incidentally, because it happens to be in the very same section of law, we also have the Uniform Signature Verification Standard. Is, is in this bill as well uh, to require that they have one set of standards that applies to all signature verification, whether it's a, a ballot petition or whether it's an application to vote um, and require that the objective, not the, sta the standard not be just that they presume any signature is valid, which of course is what the, ec the Secretary of State did. So that's in there. Uh, clarifying that poll challengers have the rights to be able to observe from a reasonable distance. That means to be able to see what they're looking at. Uh, it allows them to be replaced if they do get expelled. The, the entity that uh, appointed them, typically the, the, the parties, are able to replace them. They have a right to be, uh, to, for a written explanation if they were expelled for whatever that reason was. Um, and then they have also the right to record what's going on as long as it's not impeding on a voter's right to vote a secret ballot. Elections are, after all, public meetings. Of course, you don't want to identify how somebody voted, but apart from that, uh, we should have the right to be able to determine what's going on because that can be important when a court has to determine what actually happened. And finally, uh, the bill also uh, allows the replacement of poll challengers. I already, I already said that. What else was in here? Um, oh, that if a poll challenger is wrongfully expelled, in addition to the poll worker potentially facing criminal penalties, it's also in this bill uh, becomes a law. They also can't work at a polling place again for another two years. So... Uh, check out that bill. Uh, that is 4963. Then we have House Bill 4964. This is Representative Rendon's bill. You guys will love this. Prohibits the tabulators from being connected to, from being capable of being connected to or operated on the internet. And uh, that should be spicy hearings for sure. Uh, the pretext for allowing, well, first of all, uh, in many cases, apparently both the Dominion CEO and I saw for myself, the Secretary of State's own legislative liaison lying to these committees saying that they don't connect to the internet. Uh, and that is false. They do connect to the internet. If they didn't, they wouldn't have a problem with this bill. Uh, but of course they do have a problem with it. And what they claim they do is they connect to the internet solely for the purpose of reporting the results, which of course you could do over a phone or of course with a smartphone, which everybody has now an app to just punch in the numbers. The notion that you have to compromise the machine's integrity for performing a simple five minute task at the end of the night is absolutely ridiculous. So that is 4964. Then we have 4965. This is Representative Beth Griffin's bill. This is for spot check and informational recounts. 
So first of all, spot check recounts, allowing the political parties to pick, if they pay for it, one precinct in one race where they can have a recount. So if something is going wrong with the tabulators, and let's say there was a malicious actor changing the results of an election by the tabulator, that malicious actor won't know which precinct the given parties are going to pick to be recounted. So they wouldn't be able to not hack that one precinct. And therefore, uh, if they have a recount, the results would be obvious. So again, it's a minor thing because it's only one precinct in one race, but it gives us the option to have a spot check. Uh, and of course, audits also have these, except that in this case, the parties actually pick the precinct. So you have a fair process where the parties can, the two opposing parties can pick whichever one they'd want recounted and it'd be subject to the fee that you usually have for a recount. And then the bigger thing is the spot, ch is the, uh, the informational recounts where we take out all this language uh, saying that a precinct is unrecountable if a given set of circumstances apply. And uh, no, the precinct should only be um, unrecountable. First of all, if it's only off by one ballot, by one vote, that shouldn't be enough to make it impossible to see what the results were in a recount. If they were off by more than one, then the process would be you still have the recounting. However, it would take a court of competent dur jurisdiction to apply those recounted results. So you figure in a recounted race, first of all, it's going to be a close race to begin with. Otherwise, they don't ask for a recount. Secondly, this would only come into mattering if somehow those unrecountable precincts would actually determine the outcome of the election. So now we're talking a really, really close race where those previously unrecountable precincts actually change the result of the election. And in these circumstances, you've got a whole lot of sets of facts that a court's got to consider. What was wrong with the precinct? How impossible was it to determine why it was out of balance? These are all very fact-specific. These are going to be case-specific. So you'd want to have not just a precinct automatically being applied, uh, the recounted results, but also not have them never be applied and never be known, which is what we have now. A precinct cannot be recounted at all if it's off by just one vote. And this would change that. This would allow for there to be a finding of fact. Uh, even if the court doesn't take it up, the public would know because the, the facts are still coming out in the recount, which is a public meeting. So it provides sunlight. It would prevent, for example, massive, massive, massive uh, destruction of the ability to to recount precincts by having 70% of your precincts off balance by mostly only one vote, which is what happened in Wayne County in uh, 2020. So that is House Bill 4965. 4966, Gary Eisen's bill. Uh, this one is extending the canvassing period from 14 days to 21. Uh, so they have more time to do to conduct their canvas. And it also has some extension of preservation of documents, although federal standards are more than that. But where we had 30 days, it makes it 180. Um, and importantly, uh, a board of canvassers can rescind certification if they attest it was made under duress, which is exactly what happened in Wayne County in November 2020. They certified the election under intense public pressure and then immediately wished they hadn't. And the Secretary of State gloated sneeringly that they had no means to rescind their certification. So this would change that. Um, and so, yeah, that is Representative Eisen's bill. And then finally, we also have Representative Paquette's bill to require security features on ballots to prevent them from being easily duplicated like color inks and microprinting. We may actually amend that to add in watermarking as well as another te technique to make ballots harder to counterfeit. That's what Tennessee did. Uh, and we can do that when the bill comes up in committee. So those are the seven bills. They may be heard as early as Tuesday. Uh, however, uh, they, they might not because they were just introduced this past Thursday. And actually, as it happens... Uh, there's going to be, uh, if you guys are up on this channel, you remember we were talking about the, the case of Lucas Gerhardt, a college student who has been in car he's been under, under arrest for nearly two years now, 83 days in jail and under house arrest ever since, facing a 20-year felony for making a joke about his rifle. And um, we talked about that in more depth with his attorneys on a previous show. Um, and by the way, if you're not already, consider subscribing uh, at the link below in the video. Uh, you know, we don't really promote our YouTube channel all that much, assuming it's going to get taken down one day, uh, by the, uh, powers that be at YouTube. Um, but it doesn't hurt. And if you want to stay tuned with all of the video updates that we have, you can subscribe to our channel 
and also leave a comment if you like this kind of content if you have questions that also helps feed the algorithm and get more get more views on our videos so check that out uh, but anyway lucas gearhard his case has been taken up on appeal and that hearing is this coming tuesday in the michigan court of appeals and tuesdays are typically the days the state house uh, elections committee has their hearings and lucas's attorneys are also representative Kara's attorneys in his poll challenger lawsuit and their testimony might be important so uh there would be a conflict if they have the hearing on that same bill on tuesday however there's seven bills here that have a lot to talk about so maybe we won't have all seven bills this coming tuesday maybe we'll, we'll have them all the week after we'll see so we'll play it by ear uh we'll definitely keep you informed over email if there's going to be a committee notice and you can also if you want to find out where you can we can go to see committees uh, if you click on where legislature.mi.gov there's a little tab at the left that says committees right there so if i click on that you can go to the uh, committee page and uh, oh here's the notice about the committee meeting right there two o'clock p.m uh, and those bills are not yet on the calendar they're going to be taking up these other bills which we've talked about before uh, none of these bills really do anything honestly uh, that's a simple simple story but uh, that's that so uh, we'll see we may uh, we may go to that hearing anyway uh, but yeah uh, all, all the same especially because we've got a lot of committee testimony to prepare it's okay if we have another week on that so those are the bills if you're wondering what you can do um, all these bills have sponsors and co-sponsors if your lawmaker is not a co-sponsor you might ask them why they what why not and don't be too harsh about that some of them have a policy they don't co-sponsor anything and frankly the way it works is the lawmakers are on the floor and they're doing their stuff. Some of them have bills that are up that day and some don't. And some of them are making the rounds and signing everything they can. And some are busy doing other stuff. So sometimes co-sponsorships fall through the, cr the cracks. But most importantly, if they're not a co-sponsor, ask them, will they support the bill as written? And get them on record. Ask for an answer. Say, I want to know what your opinion is on this bill. And if they have objections, we want to know what they are. And of course, if they're going to be uh, opposing these bills and their objections are not good, then that's where you might want to uh, make sure that your friends and neighbors and fellow constituents are aware if your lawmaker does not support election integrity in the form of these seven bills. So those are the bills. Again, drop a comment. Let me know if you have any questions on these. And these are, just so you all know, these are not all the things we would want to do to reform Michigan's election law. These were seven important things that we thought had not yet had any bills introduced on these topics yet. And so we wanted to make sure that these were in the discussion that we would be having hearings on these because these are all going to be important elements of an election reform. And um, they're not everything. Uh, for example, requiring voter ID. Uh, there's a really great bill in the state Senate by Senator Lana Tice, Senate Bill 285. So great bill. Absolutely, we support it. Absolutely, that should be in the election integrity proposal. Um, but it's already been out there. It's already been introduced. So we didn't want to we want to duplicate that. We wanted to introduce seven novel, unique, different things. So again, those are the seven bills. And uh, best thing to do is contact your representative, contact your neighbors too, and get them to start talking about these things. And hey, why, why don't we have a process where we actually have bipartisan representation of election staff? Why do we have a process where ballots are easily forged? Why do we have a process where, uh, where the, the board of canvassers can say, we were threatened and we certified the results under duress under threats to our families, and now we have no process to remove certification. So get these issues out there and, and, and be talking about them. So that's what we've got for right now. Uh, it's going to be an exciting week, so stay tuned. Uh, of course, if you're not already subscribed to our email list, sign up at rescuemichigan.com and stay in touch. Appreciate you guys and all that you do for Liberty. Thanks again.